You'll find a scene like this in nearly every village, town, and city throughout the country. For in the hopes and dreams of everyone, there's a home they can call their own. Home brings a sense of security to a man. And to every woman, her home means a setting for gracious living. How do I know? Well, I'm a contractor. And over the years, I've helped a lot of people realize their dreams. Building new houses and remodeling old ones, too. And probably the most important step is the one these young people are going through right now. And we'll have the living room right in here. And the kitchen right here so we can see the children playing in the yard. Yeah, the children at... Children? Say, how many are you planning on? Not more than six, I hope. Uh, maybe I better add a few more rooms back here at that. Silly. And we have shrubbery, of course, right along in here. And, oh, darling, it's going to be just perfect. <laughs> That's right. It's the planning that makes all the difference between happiness and headaches as the years go by. White flight is often thought about as a simple physical relocation. It was a movement of whites from one place to another. But what I found is that it was really a political revolution. That as whites were confronted with the process of desegregation, whites in the South especially, they began to rethink certain basic ideas they'd had about the role of government in their lives uh, and uh, their connection to places around them. As public places desegregate, as public parks, public golf courses, public swimming pools, public schools, as they start to desegregate, whites start to abandon their traditional support of those spaces. Uh, and this leads to what we now know as the tax revolt. Uh, whites have been happy paying taxes for public parks and things like that as long as they thought of them as their places. But once they become integrated, they start to see that these places are no longer theirs. Uh, in fact, they don't even see themselves as sharing these spaces. They see them as lost uh, to blacks instead. And once that happens, they start to refuse to pay for them. So you see a shift away from conceptions of the public good and more towards a, a philosophy of uh, privatism. The suburbs, almost as much written about as Madison Avenue, and just as much in need of reflection. Though I've talked about white flight in Atlanta, the phenomenon we see here is not a southern one, it's a national one. And you can look what happens in suburbs across the country, from Denver to Rochester uh, to San Diego. Uh, the suburbs have become uh, highly isolated. Uh, there's a, what I call the politics of suburban secession it takes place across the country as these new growing suburban communities um, come together around a politics uh, that's typified by the attitude of leave us alone. Uh, they don't want anything to do with the people or the problems of the city anymore. Some of them had directly left those center cities, but not everyone. A lot of the people in the suburbs came from other parts of the country. But as they come to be suburbs that have been formed by people who had intentionally left the cities behind, um, they very easily share this attitude that they have nothing to do with the cities, that they're not responsible for their problems, that they need to be left alone and left to their own devices. Because the people who created the suburbs are young adults. And the shopping centers are built in their image. Selling to young adults demands a new kind of marketing. For these young adults, the shopping centers have built fountains, commissioned statues, put in restaurants, and freestanding stairways. They've included banks, loan offices, rental plans, plant nurseries, and places to buy building materials. The shopping centers see these young adults as people whose homes are always in need of expansion. People who buy in large quantities and truck it away in their cars. It's a big market. To help people find their cars, the centers have enlisted the children. They've put in shopmobiles to help them cover the ground. They've added banks of storage lockers, miles of checkout counters, and endless rows of carts. Carts rolling down the malls at Southdale, at Northland, at Gulfgate, Sunrise, and East Point, 
at Hillsdale and Cal I wanted to look at segregationist. Uh, I approached them as I would any other group, which is to try to understand how they understood themselves. Uh, not to excuse or absolve them, but just to understand uh, how they understood themselves. And what I realized pretty quickly is that even though we often think of segregationists as solely being against the rights of others, against the rights of African Americans to own land, to vote, uh, to work where they want, to uh, uh, consume things they want, uh, instead segregationists saw themselves first and foremost as being for their own rights, uh, the right to select their neighbors, the right to select their children's classmates, uh, most importantly the right to be left alone. Uh, as these uh, segregationists, or even people didn't think of themselves that, as these ordinary white uh, homeowners, um, start to uh, worry about uh, black homeowners moving into their neighborhoods, they band together into these neighborhood protective organizations. Uh, and they see themselves as defending the neighborhood from outsiders. But Atlanta had this reputation as the city too busy to hate, and it's one that made it look incredibly good. Uh, and in many ways, Atlanta was a